We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And so we're gonna talk about predators today. This is the fourth installment of Science of Series. We got two more after this, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so before we get started about anything about predators, we gotta figure out what a predator is. So predators are wild animals that hunt for prey um, or that they prey on other animals. So they are the ones eating other animals. So just like all animals, predators need food to survive. Um, predators like carnivores, um, they eat primarily or only meat. So things like mountain lions, coyotes, river otters, hawks, toads, ladybugs, anything can be a predator. And a lot of people think that predators are normally just things like mountain lions, grizzly bears, wolves, there's a lot of other animals out there that people don't necessarily consider a predator, um, like a ladybug. Ladybugs are actually predators. They eat aphids. So a lot of people don't understand that those are actually predators too. If you're eating something else, if you're an organism eating another organism, you are a predator. Um, some predators can also be scavengers. So just like us, I like to sit on the couch and have people bring me food. Um, Predators sometimes don't want to work for their, their meals. So a lot of the times they can be scavengers if they find an animal on the side of the road that has um, maybe been hit by a car or um, if they an animal has died from natural causes or was sick or something, they will gladly eat that animal as well. Um, things like coyotes are really good predators, badgers. Again, that's a free meal. So it's like sitting on the couch and having someone bringing your food to you. All right, so when we talk about predators, they eat prey. So what is prey? It's the opposite of a predator. So predators are the animals that are eating other things. Prey is the animal that is being eaten or the thing that's being eaten. Um, they can be anything from a 1400 pound bull moose to the smallest insect. So again, don't think of prey as just bunnies and insects. These are larger animals too, like elk can be prey. Um, deer can be prey. Larger animals are also prey. Um, some of these prey animals are herbivores, um, meaning that they only eat plants, um, but other species can be omnivores and even carnivores can be prey as well. I saw someone in the chat ask me if prey um, and predators can be the same thing or if there are predators that are also prey. Yes, good question, Sarah. They can be both. Um, for instance, a robin. So again, you don't really think of a robin as a predator. When I think of predators, I think of big teeth and claws and they're fast and um, like a tiger pops into my head right away or a mountain lion pops into my head. But a robin is a predator. It eats other animals, but it also gets eaten by other animals. So it is a predator. It eats things like worms and insects, but hawks and owls and other larger animals can also eat the robin. When you think about a toad, toads eat insects and worms and spiders, but other animals can also eat toads. Um, Toads I know have defense things, um, and we'll talk about that here later, but they still can be eaten. They might not be eaten very often um, because they have defense mechanisms, but they can be eaten. All right, so when we talk about predators, they get a really bad reputation. Um, when we talk about predators, sometimes people think they're scary. They're gonna hunt them. They're gonna eat your children in the backyard. Um, they're not. Um, so one thing we always talk about is like they kind of get this bad reputation as being the bad guys. Um, pop culture has done a lot of help with this. Um, if you've seen the movie Zootopia, this is a great movie talking about predators. Um, it talks about bunnies and foxes and how foxes and different predators are the ones that are going rogue and eating other animals and trying to eat other animals. But if you've ever, I won't ruin the movie for you, but there's a character in there. He's a fox and he gets a really bad reputation for being a fox. Um, he is a predator and the bunnies in there are kind of scared of him sometimes. So that's where that Zootopia comes in. If you saw the movie 1975, Jaws, when it came out, it's on TV all the time. So if you've missed it, you can definitely see it. Um, but Jaws, sharks are awesome animals. They do a lot of good things for the ecosystem. They're really cool animals, but they get a really bad reputation, especially things like the movie Jaws. Or if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, they try to eat Marlin and his friends. Um, Another animal um, that does a really good job of getting a bad reputation are tigers. Have you ever seen the movie The Jungle Book, uh, Shere Khan, or the Anaconda movies? I love snakes. Like, I love anacondas. I think they're super cool. But movies like the Anaconda movies where, you know, they grow to like 50 feet long and they eat people, 
that's not helping the situation here, but it does happen um, where predators get a really bad reputation. So I'm sure you can think of some other ones. Um, I have a quick poll here. I just wanna see if you guys, um, out of these, uh, which of the following is your favorite pop predator, uh, pop, pop culture predator? Is it Nick from Zootopia? Is it Jaws, Shere Khan from the um, uh, Mowgli, what's it, Jungle Book, there we go. Um, when you search or Google search predators, uh, my first thought is not the actual predator from the movie Predator. Um, that's what you get when you search predator in Google. Um, the Little Red Riding Hood um, wolf is also a predator. So it's things like stories and movies that really give predators a bad name, um, but they're not. They're really good for the environment. They help the ecosystem out a ton. And we'll talk about that today. But really quick, this kind of a fun poll here. Um, What's out of these, what are your favorites? It looks like Jaws and Shere Khan are really, are tied here. So, uh, oh, 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 no, it's, no, it's still changing. So thanks for voting. If you haven't before, I'm sure you can think of some other ones as well. So, all right. So when we talk about predators, what is their role in the ecosystem? So when we talk about food chains and food webs, we usually think of predators in the, um, in the food chains being at the top. Sometimes we call them apex predators. So predators are part of the food chain, whether you like them or not, they help move the food chain along. So the food chains and food webs are processes of passing energy from one organism to the next. So if you think back to like, I don't know, fourth grade biology and talking about food chains and food webs, you know that the producers are on the bottom and then as you go up, the energy moves from each level to the next and the tertiary consumers of the apex predators are ones that are at the top. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today are those predators that don't necessarily have another um, animal that can eat them, but also things like toads and robins that are also predators. So. Um, all these different food chains and food webs, they interact together, um, and, but we're going to be talking about predators today. All right, so population cycles of predators. So when you look at populations of organisms, they never remain constant. They can be totally and drastically different from one time period to the next. Um, a good example that we always talk about in school are things like hares and foxes. Um, or hares and coyotes. So um, when you look at the prey and the predator abundances, they shift up and down and up and down. Um, but the whole important thing is that when food is abundant, prey populations will grow. So for instance, hares or rabbits, if there's a lot of food for those rabbits to eat, there's gonna be a lot of prey. There's gonna be a lot of rabbits because they have a ton of resources. Well, when those prey and those numbers of resources grow, the number of predators will also grow um, because they have a ton of food as well. So slowly over time, these graphs that slowly change, um, what will happen is the more that the prey increases, the more that the predators will increase. And when the prey goes down, the predators goes down. Um, but what happens always is that the predator abundance is always lower than the prey. So there is, there are more prey than there is predators. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a, a huge issue in this food chain and this food web and in this population. All right, so predators and prey, they basically co-adapted to live with each other. Um, if you ever heard of the arms race, um, Russia and the United States trying to get to the, to, the, um, to the moon first and who's trying to get into space first. Um, you've heard about Sputnik, that kind of always, um, I always kind of relate that. One person went better, one person did this, one person did this, one person did this. So predators and prey, they co-adapt to live with each other. So prey is gonna be part of a predator's environment. Uh, a predator is going to die if they can't catch their food. So they need food to survive, just like that prey, prey animal does. Um, a predator will slowly adapt um, and evolve over time to get their food. They're going to get stronger. They're going to get faster. They're going to develop different mouth parts. They might develop an immunity to venom or poison. Um, again, this is going to take generations and generations to happen, but over time, they're going to adapt to slowly, hopefully, be able to get their prey. Um, a predator is also a part of the prey's environment. So as the predator is evolving, so is the prey. It's going to adapt to not get eaten. It's going to get better hearing, better eyesight. It might develop venom or poison. Their smell might increase. So all these animals are co-adapting so that they always are kind of above each other. 
Um, the fastest predators are the ones that are going to catch the food and be able to survive, and the fastest prey are the ones that are not going to get eaten. All right, so one thing I do want to talk about is um, you might have heard about the wolf reintroduction um, in the 90s back in the Yellowstone. I know this isn't part of Nebraska, but this kind of just goes to show how important predators are to the environment. Um, and one of the best examples out there is how predators change Yellowstone National Park. So back in um, the 30s, wolves in Yellowstone were in Yellowstone was completely eliminated. Um, this triggered a huge cascade effect among all of these other animals. Um, so what it did is there was lots of elk population. Well, elk are like, wow, there's no wolves. I don't really need to hurry. I'm just going to sit here and eat my grass. So um, they didn't move around a lot and they didn't really have anything to worry about. So they ate a lot of food and they had a lot of babies and there was a lot of elk um, in Yellowstone. And they might not sound like a bad thing, but they're going to graze a lot of grass and they're going to eat a lot of trees and they're going to take a lot of food away from other animals. Um, so what happened is they ate a lot on the willow, the aspen, and the cottonwood trees. Um, what happened then is this affected the beaver population. There was no food for them for winter, so the beavers of Yellowstone slowly started dying out. Um, it also affected the beavers' ability to, if there's no beavers, there's no uh, way for them to uh, dam up streams and rivers, and that then affects all the fish in there, and then the birds that eat the fish. So this one organism had this huge cascade effect for all these other animals. So researchers and scientists kind of realized, oh man, we have an issue. So in 1995, gray wolves were rashly taken, um, borrowed, I guess, and not given back, but borrowed um, from Canada, um, and they reintroduced them into Yellowstone. Um, so one beaver colony was back in the 30s um, when all these wolves were gone. Today there are nine. So nine beaver colonies is a huge success um, back from 1995. So um, one thing I do want to point out though is that in 1968 the elk population was one third of what it is today. So it was actually smaller. Why is that? Um, today there are actually three times as many elk um, and the willow trees are very robust. So we have a ton of elk that are there now, but they're moving to different places. So these wolves are chasing them, they're moving them to different areas. So um, there's more elk there now, but they're rotating their grazing. So they're not eating just one area at a time. The wolves are making them move. Um, so over time, the beavers were then um, able to build new dams and ponds, which helped provide water for fish, birds, macro invertebrates, songbirds. So People are saying that the wolves actually changed the whole ecosystem of Yellowstone. It helped them. Um, there's a lot of controversy though, talking about wolves. A lot of people don't like them. Um, people are saying that they're getting out and eating their uh, livestock. There's just a lot of issues with predators, but we have seen from the science that predators actually change their ecosystem. All right, so when we talk about predators, no matter what they are, whether they are a ladybug or a mountain lion, or toad, um, there's different types of predation. So there's three different types that we're going to talk about today. The number one one that we all know is carnivory. So this is like your mountain lion that you have. They are the most common types of predators. So carnivores are going to be the animals that eat other animals. They strictly eat other animals. Um, this involves the predator consuming meat um, of other animals um, or non-plant organisms. So when we talk about carnivores, there's actually two different kinds. Um, there's something called an obligatory carnivore, which means that they have to eat meat to survive. Um, if you guys have house cats at home, they are obligatory carnivores. If you guys have a mountain lion at home, which you should not have a mountain lion at home, but if you do, they are obligatory carnivores. Um, weasels are also gonna be um, river otters. They have to have meat to survive. It is not something that they choose to eat every once in a while, but they have to have it to survive. There's also something called a facultative carnivore, which is something like people and dogs. We can eat meat. You know, I might like to have chicken strips once in a while or a steak once in a while, but I don't need it to survive. All those people that um, have decided to become vegetarians, they survive on their own without meat. So we don't have to have it to survive, but some animals definitely do need it to survive. All right, so this one's a little bit of a I don't know, some people might have an issue with this actually being a type of predation, 
but I thought I would in include it just because. Um, so some people talk about this as predation because these are animals eating other organisms eating another organism. So we could talk about herbivory. This is like the most uncommon type and a lot of people don't even consider this a type of predation, but this is a predator. So like a deer consumes an autotroph like land plants or algae. So this is like your deer eating your grass. Um, again, a lot of people don't consider this um, predation, but it's an organism eating an organism, so I thought I would include it. So we have this thing called a monophagus, which is an organism that eats one type of plant. So they have a strict one type of plant that they only eat. A great example of this would be like koalas. So koalas eat eucalyptus, and that's pretty much the only thing, that is the only thing that they eat. And then we also have a polyphagous animal, which eats different types of plants. So this would be like your deer. Your deer could eat alfalfa, it could eat your watermelon, it could eat, um, plants in the forest. So there's lots of different things that can eat. So again, it's not necessarily a type of predation, but I thought I would include it anyway. All right, next one is parasitism. This is like your ticks and your headlights. Um, so this is one organism that is the parasite. It benefits at the expense of another host organism. So not all parasitism is considered predation because not all parasites feed off the host. Sometimes they just use it for food or, sh or for shelter or reproductive purposes and then they leave. So they never usually feed on the host. That's very um, unusual, but it does happen. So a common example is like head lice. If you've ever had head lice, which I hope you have not, but if you have, it happens. Um, use the human scalp as a host um, and they feed off your blood. It causes negative health effects, but it does not kill the host. So they feed, you have an issue, they don't, you don't like them in your hair, they leave, you're fine. So this is a type of parasitism. Um, not all parasitism does, can kill the host, although it can sometimes. All right, so those are the three types of predation. Now we're gonna talk about different types of predators. All right, so vertebrate predators. This are gonna be your things with a backbone. This is an internal skeleton. These are things that are gonna be like mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, all the animals that have a backbone. So for example, a ladybug is not a vertebrate predator because it doesn't have a backbone. So although all these animals, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, fish, they represent a very small percentage of animals, but their size and their mobility are the ones that are gonna make them dominate their environment. So like a walleye or a mountain lion, People usually don't say that they're afraid of ladybugs um, that are gonna eat them. We don't get a lot of calls about that. We get a lot of calls about people being scared of mountain lions um, just because they're faster, they're bigger, they have claws, they have lots of different things that make people um, sometimes wary and other prey worthy. So you're also gonna have invertebrate predators. These are things that are going to lack a backbone. Um, so they're called invertebrates. They're um, most, they're gonna be cold-blooded which means their temperature of their body depends on the temperature of their environment. And these vertebrate predators include things like jellyfish, tapeworms, insects, arachnids, crustaceans. Um, I can't for the life of me remember what it's called, um, but it has been found in one lake in Nebraska. Um, Nebraska does have jellyfish. We have one kind of jellyfish that has been found here. It is not venomous, it does not hurt people, but we have seen them, I think, in one lake towards Omaha. And if anyone knows what it is, you can type it in the chat box, that would be great. I can't think of what it's called. All right, we also have carnivorous plants. A lot of you might be familiar with something called a Venus flytrap. So these are the tooth, toothy looking um, plants that they actually will hold open and then something like a fly will come in and it'll land and they will slowly shut. And the enzymes in that plant will actually digest that um, that fly and make it um, its meal. So we have two uh, native carnivorous plants in Nebraska. They look very pretty and they look nothing like a Venus flytrap. They are called the common bladderwort and the lesser bladderwort. These are actually aquatic plants. Um, so when you look at them, they have these things called bladders, like little pouches um, that grow above the water and are yellow, um, at least for the common bladderwort one. And they have little tiny hairs at the opening of these little pockets um, which serve as triggers. So when something like a gnat or a fly or something goes in there, um, it mechanically contracts and it grabs and sucks in that animal and a bunch of water and it will eat that animal. So the enzymes that are in the plant and the stalk of the plant 
will actually help digest that food. So we technically call them carnivorous because they can eat other animals. So very neat that plants can do that as well. All right, so how do these animals eat stuff? So we know the different types of predators. We know what we have in Nebraska, but how are they effective hunters and how do they get their food? So one of the things that is like the most common thing for a predator to do is gonna be the chase, or sometimes we call this pursuit predation. So this is a form of predation that hunters will chase their prey um, a lot of the times and hopefully the prey run away. Um, which ensues in the chase, but again, not always. There's not a lot of smart animals out there sometimes, not a lot of smart predators, but it does happen. So the chase is either initiated by the prey or it's initiated by the predator. This takes time and effort. And um, one of the things we have to worry about with chasing is that it burns a lot of energy. So if you think about it, um, a coyote chasing or a bobcat chasing a, um, a rabbit or something, they have to be faster than the rabbit to be able to catch that rabbit but it burns a lot of energy and it burns a lot of calories. So they have to be able um, to make sure that when they go after something, it has to be worth their time. They have to offset that energy that was burned by the amount of calories that they take in. So a lot of the times things like hawks, they can eat grasshoppers and they sometimes might eat a lot of grasshoppers, but grasshoppers don't have a lot of calories and they don't have a lot of meat on them to be really honest. So a lot of times hawks will go after things like rodents instead because they're more worth their time. If they're gonna chase this animal, they wanna make sure that they're eating something big um, to offset that energy cost that they did to chase it. All right, we also have animals that stalk. Um, if you think about it, a heron is a really great example. We have great blue herons in Nebraska. Um, and what they will do is you will often see them wading or walking very slowly in the water. Um, they're looking for their food. They're stalking their prey. A lot of the times they stand either motionless or like I said, they walk really uh, close to the shore and very slowly so that they can find their prey. Um, when they do see it, they use their long beak to plunge and kind of spear their animals. So they're gonna eat things like fish and frogs and um, snakes, so anything worth their time. Um, so they don't have to chase their prey, so they can go for smaller things. They don't burn a lot of energy just walking around or sitting still. Um, the only downfall of this type of predation is that it takes a long time to find something. Um, it's pretty easy to find something that's running away from you, but when you're looking in the water and looking around, it's harder to find something worth your time. It takes longer to find something. So they can choose to eat smaller things because they don't burn enough energy to worry about it. All right, there's ambush predators. So spiders, uh, this is a crab spider. So if you've ever seen crab spiders in Nebraska, they have really, really kind of long sticky out legs. It looks like a crab. So these are also called the sit and wait predators or these are the, uh, I don't wanna say lazy predators, but they are, they would be a moniker predator. If I was a predator, this would be me. I would sit and wait because I am not a fast runner and I don't want to spend time stalking my prey. So uh, they will typically trap their prey um, by either stealth or by strategy um, rather than speed and strength. So what they will do, like a toad is a perfect example of this. They will sit there and the only movement that they will make is that their um, mouth will be moving up and down. So, because that's their breathing. So what they do is they literally sit there and wait for something to walk by like a cricket or a worm or something. And when they walk by or they slither by, that is when they grab it. So um, they are these sit and wait predators. A lot of the times these guys have good camouflage. If you look at this picture of the spider on here, if you were an animal that has really bad eyesight, it is very hard to see a green spider on a green leaf. Um, these are a lot of things like spiders, insects, mantises, snakes will do this too, toads, frogs, fish. Um, these are not gonna be your big, um, carnivores like mountain lions or coyotes. A lot of the times it's not going to be them. All right, there's also another hunting strategy, um, pack animals or pack hunting, or we call it teamwork. A lot of the time these are going to be animals that are in the same family units. This is going to be a lot of dogs. Um, lions are another good example. Wolves are good examples. Um, what they can do then is instead of going after a small rabbit, they're not gonna take six coyotes to hunt down one small rabbit. They're gonna go for larger prey, like an elk or a deer. Um, so they can pursue larger prey and it's often faster than them, 
um, they can take turns running after it. So this is good uh, social uh, aspects of their, of their family groups. This is animals that are very social with each other. Um, and they can also then protect their young pups when the, um, when the hunters are out hunting. Um, this can be beneficial and successful and harmful at the same time. So if you're a coyote and you're the lazy coyote, you're still gonna eat. If you're the one that's not running as fast as everybody else, you're still gonna be able to get some food. Um, but at the same time, those coyotes that are burning more energy and working harder than their other family members, they're losing energy because they're running faster and yet the slow person is still getting to eat. So it's harmful, but it's also very beneficial. Um, the increase in capture rate and maximum prey size depends on how well and how social those animals are. So the better the family unit, the better the teamwork. Monica, we've got yeah. a couple questions. One of them was um, cannibalism. Is that considered a, a, maybe a, a type of predation? Um, I would guess, yeah, because it's a, an organism eating another organism, even if it is your same one. So like salamanders are really good cannibals um, oftentimes. So yeah, I would call it, that's a good question. And then your other question that you have is what your favorite Nebraska predator is and why, and then what your favorite non-Nebraska one is. All right, Sarah, good question. Um, my favorite Nebraska predator is going to be any snake. I'm a snake nerd. I love snakes. Um, my, probably a racer because they are super fast and they use cool periscoping um, eyesight instead of um, like normal snakes, they'll sit up in the grass and look around and, and slither away and they'll sit up in the grass and look around. My favorite non-Nebraska predator, hmm, I feel like a tiger. I just always think of a, a predator as a tiger, so good question. And then the other one, so a predator is something eating something else, so the biggest predator or largest predator. I don't know if they mean on land or water, but largest predator? Well, um, yeah, are we talking about Nebraska? Are we talking about in the world? Um, probably the biggest predator on land in Nebraska is gonna be our mountain lion. Uh, I don't know, Amanda, what do you think is our big water one? Like a well, ally or? Well, that's what I was wondering if, if we meant like worldwide, would, would a whale, you know what I mean, be the yeah. large, because it eats other things. Yeah. Um, world a whale would definitely be it because it eats krill so yeah and it's they're giants they're huge they are they are um, yeah. but those are all great questions coming from our chat box thank you very much glad we can answer those all right all right so we'll go ahead and move on um we're going to talk about different adaptations and cool tools of the trade that predators and prey have all right, so vision. Uh, vision is gonna be the number one thing that good predators need. Um, you often do not see blind coyotes doing very well in the wild uh, just because they can't see to eat. So it is most important sense for a predator to have. Um, that being said, there's different types of vision. So when we look at the eyes of a predator, um, a good example, I'm just gonna go with a mountain lion here. When you look straight on a mountain lion, their eyes are kind of close together and then they're in the front of their head. So they have something called binocular vision. Um, so if you think about a binocular, that's what you're looking at. Um, this area, um, when we talk about that, it basically each eye sees just a slightly different image um, and it sends your message to the brain so you can help determine how far away something is and how fast it is moving. Um, so when we talk about eyes, there's a lot of different types of eyes out there. You have the binocular vision, but then you have something like a um, bird and an insect that is able to capture insects and prey right out of the air. Like dragonflies are predatory insects and they grab mosquitoes right out of the air. Um, so birds have what we call telescope-like vision um, and it's like eight times better than ours. So as humans, our eyesight kind of sucks. As predators, um, we, are, we are not the best predators. We use different abilities, not necessarily our vision or our smell. So, uh, some predators have more than one set of eyes, like as you can see here, spiders and scorpions have clusters of eyes, um, and each eye is actually going to do something different. So like on a spider, um, you're going to have eyes that help um, 
determine distance. Um, some images or some eyes will determine what they're looking at. Others detect if it's moving. So each of those eyes and clusters of eyes work together. Um, when we talk about nocturnal hunters, um, animals are going to have special mirror-like images on the back of their eyes to help them see in the dark. So um, one thing that's kind of cool and I always get questions on is if you take a picture or a flashlight um, out and you see animals with like red eyes staring at you, um, those are going to be predators and that's that mirror-like um, structure in the back of their eye reflecting that light um, so it sometimes looks red. Um, all, a lot of animals can do that, it's not just predators. All right, so hearing, a lot of predators have a good sense of hearing. Um, again, they need to be able to hear their food. Um, mammals, we have external ear flaps, so if you look at your ears, we have external flaps that can swivel, we can move forward and backward, it helps us to pinpoint the sound. It's like hearing an ambulance coming at you. Um, a lot of bats, they have special ear shapes um, that they can use to um, determine, um, it kind of adapts to their environment and then they can be able to see and hear what, what they're looking at. So owls, they say they have the best hearing because their ears are offset. So they're not symmetrical like ours are. One's gonna be up here and one's gonna be down here. They're a little forward, backward from each other. It's like surround sound so they can figure out where their prey is gonna be. And then some animals don't have any ears like a snake. They don't have external ears. They use vibrations, um, so when they're slithering on the ground, they feel vibrations in their mouth or their bones on their uh, nerves of their ears, and that sends up images and um, messages to their brain saying, okay, I hear something or I feel something moving. Uh, smell, they also have to have good smell. Um, some animals can smell from a mile away. Again, humans, we have really kind of sucky smell compared to other animals. Um, foxes can smell food that is buried under two feet of soil. Snakes use their tongue to smell, um, so it's split in two at the very end so that they can grab particles from two different directions. So they can smell, okay, it smells more over here than it does over here. Um, and then they use that scent to taste the air. Um, but you also have to think about things like air currents, breezes, um, vegetation, humidity are all gonna affect how an animal smells. Um, if the wind is really strong, they're going to be able to smell better than if there's no wind at all. All right, so how do predators prey on things? How do they eat things? They have very good teeth. Um, teeth are going to be their knives and their forks that they're going to use. Um, most mammals have three different kinds of teeth. We have them too. We have incisors that are used to cut your food. You have your canines that are used for kind of tearing chunks off, like if you eat a steak or something. These are also gonna be the kill piece uh, in a lot of different animals. And then we also have molars. They're in the back, they're flat, they're pretty strong, and they're used to chew and grind. Um, we are considered omnivores. We eat plants and meat, but things like mountain lions, they're not gonna have a lot of molars because they're not chewing a lot of their food. They're not like a cow. They're going to be um, grabbing, tearing, and swallowing. They don't need a lot of teeth. They just need sharp teeth. All right, they also need very good jaws, strong jaws, um, as well in teeth are important. Um, they also need powerful, powerful muscles with leverage and gripping power um, so that they can bite down onto their food. Uh, for instance, snakes are able to open their mouths super wide and super tall because they have kind of rubber band stretchy ligaments that help them eat something about three times the size of their head. If we eat something three times the size of our head, we'd eat like a watermelon in one bite. We just can't do that. And they also talk about bite force. Um, so lots of animals like grizzly bears, lions, crocodiles, they have the largest bite force um, because they have strong muscles and jaws and teeth. It's not just one thing that contributes to bite force. It's all of those things. So if you guys want to try and guess what, ha what animal has the largest bite force, it's not something that we have in Nebraska. I'm going to point that out. It lives in Africa. I'll give you a hint. It is the saltwater crocodile, has the largest bite force. And if you were with me last week on bites and stings, we talked about this, um, but they have the largest bite force of any animal. So they measure it in pounds per square inch. So crocodiles have about 3,700 pounds per square inch of their bite. That's huge. 
All right, claws and nails. These are different from each other. A lot of people kind of just say claws and nails together, but they're very different. So claws are super powerful weapons. Nails can be as well, I guess. Birds and prey have powerful claws. They're called talons. Um, a lot of big cats have claws that they can use to rip and tear. Um, they are able to retract, except for cheetahs. They, they are not able to do that. So claws contain nerves and blood vessels, and they are attached to bones that come out of the end of their toes. Nails, they grow from cuticles. So look at your nails. These are not claws, they are nails. Claws are meant for digging and climbing. Nails are kind of meant to look pretty, in my opinion. But. All right, tongues are also good. So frogs and toads have tongues that attach to the front of their mouth, and they're fast. So these guys can shoot out their tongue, capture an insect, and pull it back in their mouth in 0 0.07 seconds, which is five times faster than you can blink. Um, insects, the, the impact of the tongue when they go to grab something in the air or grab something on the ground, it is 12 Gs, or 12 times the force of gravity. So for all of us that watch the space, um, the launch a couple months ago, they experienced about three Gs or three times the force of gravity. When you get hit, if you're a cricket, you get hit by a frog tongue, you're experiencing 12 Gs, so 12 times the force of, force of gravity. So it's a very strong tongue, which I just cannot get over. I think that's so cool. So a lot of animals um, have also developed venom or poison. They are not the same. Um, a lot of people just say poisonous snakes. It's like nails on a chalkboard. That is totally not true in Nebraska. There are, is one poisonous snake, but we're not gonna get into that today. So poison has to be either swallowed, inhaled, or absorbed. These are things like toads or poison ivy. Venom is going to be, it has to come in contact with your bloodstream. So snakes are venomous, bees are venomous, spiders are venomous. So you got a great graphic right here. You're not gonna bite a snake. Um, Hopefully not, but you're not going to bite a snake to get that venom. Camouflage, so an adaptation that's used by both predators and prey. Um, the look of similar surroundings, they're able to blend into the environment. If you ever look at a catfish, they are dark on top, light on the bottom. Um, some animals change with the season. So like coyotes, they are going to be more ready orange in the uh, summertime and then in the winter time they're going to be more gray and brown because they blend in better with their environment. Um, some animals are going to imitate or mimic other animals like stick bugs. They look like a stick. That's helping them camouflage. And then some animals have bright coloration like poison dart frogs. Usually they say the brighter the animal the more you should leave it alone. It is a warning sign. Monarchs are a good example. Um, they just taste bad. So if you eat a monarch because the caterpillars eat the milkweed, they're gonna taste really bad. It's a warning to, hey, stop, don't eat me. All right, I do wanna show you this picture because I think it's really cool. I'll give you about 10 seconds to find the mountain lion. It's, it's, I, this was a game camera, I think in Montana. This is an elk that's bent over. There's a mountain lion somewhere in the background. It took me a while to find it, but now I, I see it so I can see it. But give you about five seconds to find this animal. <clears throat> it is in there, I promise. All right, if you look, it is right here. This is how good camouflage is for predators and for prey. So they need to be able to um, camouflage so that their prey or their other predator does not see them. All right, so how does prey get away? Well, they can use an invisibility cloak. They can also use camouflage. They can run. They can say, well, you can eat me, but you're gonna die, like a poison dart frog. They have armor sometimes. Sometimes they play dead like a possum. They can mimic other scary animals. They might disguise themselves. Um, also strength in numbers. I'm not gonna mess with 80 squirrels. If I'm a coyote, I don't wanna mess with 80 squirrels. So there's strength in numbers by far. All right, so that's all that I have for predators. I know that went a little longer this week, but there was a lot of cool information I wanted us to make sure we got through. So next week, same time, Thursday, August 6th, we're gonna do 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. We're gonna talk about animal love, which is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, just kind of how different animals, how different animals do it and how they are excited to get a female or what they do once they have a female. There's a lot of cool things out there in Nebraska, a lot of cool mating rituals and things like that. So 
that's what we will talk about next week. I will keep it as clean as possible next week, um, but it is a little, a little difficult with animal love. So, and then the next two weeks we have animal love and then we have animal myths um, on the 13th. And then we have more topics starting September 3rd. So stay tuned. Otherwise, thanks for joining us and we'll talk about animal love next week. So does anyone have any questions? Um, Roger had pointed out that the name of the jellyfish in Nebraska, yeah. hopefully I'm not slaughtering it, is it hydromedusa? Does that sound That sounds correct? right. I think that is. Yeah, I could not have remembered that. So thank you. So we have another um, question um, asking for clarification about ambush and stock predators um, and they're very similar. They both wait to attack, but was wondering if you could tell us the difference between an ambush and a stalking predator. Oh, good question. So ambush predators are usually going to have a special adaptation that helps them. They're going to have like a trap or a strategy or they're going to have a really long tongue that impacts them like a frog. Um, and then things like the weight and attack, like the heron that we talked about, the stalk, they're still going to use like their speed and their strength. Usually what they're looking for is something smaller than them, like a heron and a fish. Um, but a lot of times things like a frog can eat something almost the same size as their mouth. So um, that's a good question. It kind of runs that fine line, but when I looked up this information, it was very different from the two of them. So I hope that kind of makes sense and clears things up. So, yeah. Um, have they recorded any wolves being in Nebraska? Uh, yes, I'm not going to exactly, I don't know the exact issue or the, statistics on this, but just like other animals that have occasionally come into Nebraska, it does happen sometimes, but it's, it's very unusual. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you sticking around talking about predators with me next week. Like I said, we're talking about animal love. Um, I'll keep it as clean as I can when it talks about animal love, but um, we will kind of talk about some different animals in Nebraska and how they, some different cool things that animals do to attract females or males and how they decide and just kind of the science behind it. So do frogs Ooh. have teeth? Yep. Uh, no. If you've ever, if you ever got a fish before and you've sucked like your finger in their mouth, they have kind of like that serrated feeling to them. They're not true teeth but they're like little project projections of skin. I think there actually might be one frog in the world, like in, in the Amazon or something that actually does have teeth, but I can't tell you what it's called. Good question. All right. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week, Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Stop.